Good morning. Good morning Thank you. He, he had yes. to meet his son this morning. If yeah. you know, you know. Oh, man. My name is Tyler. I'm a youth pastor here at MRCC. And I am Brent, and I am your online campus and media pastor. And it turns out two tall bearded guys are not the greatest at giving announcements on women's ministries. Who would have thought? Yeah. So yeah. we have a guest with us. Uh, Cheryl is gonna, here to just give an announcement about what's happening in women's ministries at MRCC. Good morning. Uh, this is kind of a final chance to invite all the women of the church to join us tomorrow night for our kickoff event. It's at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. We'll have um, some worship time and dinner together. It'll be a good time. But most importantly, this is where you'll come to find out about all the things that are available um, to women here. Every year after we do kickoff, someone says to me, I didn't know. I didn't know we did that. I didn't know we had that. So this is your chance to um, come and, and meet all the women that are involved in ministry and find out where you can slot in and find your people. Yeah, and if you haven't gotten one of these cards, yes. uh, Cheryl has You probably have. A lot We've of been them. Like, sending and, them and yeah. stopping you. And, but, you know, we didn't want to miss anybody. Yeah, so. so if you're a lady in the building, raise your hand for me. Okay, half of you didn't do it. Anybody need all a card? Of you, <laughs> all of you need to leave with a card. And so you have all of the information, right? Right. Perfect. And yes. she'll be here tomorrow. We will not be. No. No, we no, won't. No, not at all. Thank you, Cheryl. No. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, so we also have, now that we're like, kind of kicking off everything, we're into the fall, we're in September. I can't believe it. Time flies. But uh, one of the things that's starting back up again is our small groups. And if you have, maybe you've been a part of a small group before and you're just really looking and hoping to get plugged back into one, uh, that setting where you can just build relationship with other believers, uh, it gets kind of hectic on a Sunday with so many of us. And so small groups are a great way for us to build our faith around side other believers uh, in a smaller setting. And so if if you have been, maybe you've been feeling that call, uh, that nudge to join a group, uh, we have sign-up sheets out in the foyer. We have a, an entire team that's out there. They can answer questions. They'd love to help get you connected somewhere. You can also just fill out the form online if you scan that QR code, and, and you can also sign up for a small group that way. Yeah, coming up on September 22nd, we are dedicating a portion of each service to child dedication, and we're going to do it corporately. So if child dedication is something on your mind, um, we want to invite you to get signed up for that. You can sign up. Uh, you can call the church office, or you can just sign up at mrccnow.org. Yep, and uh, another thing that happens in the fall is school starts again. And so I know many uh, of us who are a part of MRCC are involved in education somehow. Maybe you're a teacher. Uh, maybe you work at a school. And, you know, that's a ministry. That is an important ministry. It's something that maybe we don't always realize. Uh, but that's an area where um, it is near and dear to God's heart, right? Uh, you know, spending time with teaching, raising up young kids, the next generation. And so we want to support that. And, uh, and if you are involved in education, if you're a teacher, uh, if there are any needs that you have for your classroom, maybe uh, there's some equipment or something that would really help benefit uh, you doing your work, doing your ministry there um, where you work, then we would love to help you. Just let us know. Give the office a call. Reach out to one of uh, us on staff. We would love to help resource that and support you. Yeah, and uh, if you uh, come into this building at all, which you're all here, and you look down the hallway, you may have noticed some construction happening. Uh, that is par for the course at MRCC. We love construction projects. And so um, right now, please bear with us. The carpet's getting torn up. We're changing the room down there a little bit. We added a wall and some doors so we can do more ministry things. And so uh, we just want you to to know that it is not always like this. And so uh, we have so many things that are going to be happening. Breakfast Club, which is our... Sunday morning youth uh, gathering uh, during this 9.30 a.m. gathering happens, uh, but it's not going to happen until after the construction is over. So hopefully next Sunday, um, look out on social media for that announcement. But also there is some uh, a Wednesday night gathering that is going to be happening uh, coming up for adults down in room 105. And Pastor Greg is going to uh, have more information on, on that. So I'm waiting for him to understand that that's his cue for him to come up. Okay, there it is. <laughs> I stalled as much as I could. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
It's kind of fun to just let him twist in the wind, though, you know, is actually. Thank you, Pastor Tyler. Yeah, it's good to be back, church. Um, if you forgot who I am, my name's Greg. I serve the church here. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, it really is. It's great to go, but it's, it, I mean it. It really is cool to come back and to see your face and to feel your spirit. Thank you for letting us get away. I have to tell you, that's the third time this year that we've snuck away for a few days to the coast. One was in March, one was in June, and then this was in September. And every single time we've gone to the coast, we've had beautiful, gorgeous weather, which just goes to show you, God loves me more than he loves you. I don't know how else to explain that. It was just spectacular uh, over there at the coast. Uh, really good time, a uh, uh, great time away. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, Wednesday night, uh, our adult Bible study is kicking back in. It'll be happening in room 105 down the hall. You're invited to come and be a part of that. It's casual. Uh, but, but listen, friends, uh, this won't be like Sunday morning. This is Bible study. If you remember Sunday school. This is, let's get down in the dirt and dig and in the weeds and do all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's lots of things happening here on the campus on Wednesday night, youth group, Impact Forge for the kids, ladies Bible studies, there's a lot going on. Uh, but if you want to be part of that Bible study, bring your Bible and come and join us on Wednesday night. We're going to do some some serious uh, Bible study uh, starting uh, this coming Wednesday. So love to see you be part of that. Uh, we're going to start, though, this morning, a new teaching series in First Peter chapter 1. And um, before we jump into that, before I, I start into that, I think you feel like I feel, uh, first of all, a great sense of relief because football season is finally here. Somebody say amen, right? Which means mercifully that we're just about ready to forget about the Mariners. Thank you, Lord, and uh, move on into football season. So that's a good thing. But no, on a serious note, our nation needs prayer. And shootings and violence and strife and discord. And the Bible says that we are a royal priesthood. Followers of Jesus are called to be people who pray for our nation. And, and let's, let's do that together this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord God, we come to you this morning with sore hearts, Lord, because of the things that happen in our land. And God, um, they can be so discouraging, Lord, the violence, the, the strife, the, the discord, Lord, and the, just all that. And, and yet, we remember, God, that you said if, if your people would humble themselves and pray, if we would cry out to you, if we would seek you, then, then you will bring healing to our land. And, and that's what we're praying for this morning, God. We think of families that are grieving. We think of communities that are broken, God. We think of people who are not wrestling against flesh and blood. They're wrestling against each other. God, we pray that you would bring healing to our land that you would renew and restore us in our hearts. And God, you tell us that we, your church, we're the salt and the light. So God, help us to be that. Help us to be that, we pray. We lift up our leaders that you would give them wisdom, God. We offer ourselves that we might be useful to the healing of our land. We pray for that. And, and this morning, we lift up our kids in Children's Church. We remember that that that's where the center of gravity and ministry is. It's in the kids building over here. We're just a sideshow. God, we pray, pour out your spirit on our kids, on our teachers, on our leaders there. And then finally, Lord, as we open your word together, uh, help us to hear you. Give us, like you were so fond of saying, Jesus, give us ears to hear this morning, eyes to see as we open your word together. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 1, and as we begin this verse-by-verse verse study through 1 Peter, let me remind us of why we do this kind of teaching as a church. Uh, when we go through God's word verse-by-verse, verse, which is his plan for you to grow to the point where you do, when we do that, what we're doing is we're allowing God to speak to us on his terms. Most of the time, our default is to look at our situation, our circumstances, and say, God, I need to know about this, this, and that. There's nothing wrong with that. But as we mature and grow up in our faith, we increasingly learn how to say, God, more than I need to know what I think I need to know, I need to know what you think I need to know. 
And so before I talk about what's on my heart, I want to hear about what's on yours. And that's, that's what mature Christian faith looks like. We listen to God first. We say, God, before I talk, you talk. And then let's go from there. And so uh, these next couple of months, we're going to be walking verse by verse through First Peter and letting God speak to us on his terms. And I want to invite you to just say, you know what, I'm going to do that. Rather than focusing on what I'm dealing with right now, I'm going to let God talk to me about what he feels that I need to hear. And, and let me begin doing that this morning by asking you a question. Have you ever been specifically picked or chosen, right? Like, have you ever had somebody say, I want you to help me with this? And, and they weren't choosing you just because you were a warm body. They were choosing you because you were you. You know, remember when we were on the playground and we were kids and we'd choose up sides and how it felt to be chosen first or second and, and how it felt to be chosen maybe not first or second. That feeling is a cool feeling. And, and when it happens to us, there's a part of us that responds to it. I have to tell you a quick illustration of this. Our, our family, Ron and I, our home is a dog house. All right? It's a dog home. We've always had dogs since we were newlyweds, and uh, that's always part of our agenda. In fact, we say to each other, if our marriage ever fails, it's could be as we go through a stretch when we don't have a dog to function with in our home because the house just seems to get centered around the dog. And, and that's always been the case, and, and almost always the dog's connect to Rhonda. They really end up being mom's dog at the end of the day, right? The first dog we got before we had kids, Cinnamon, very quickly became Rhonda's dog. And she followed Rhonda around. She now with Rhonda. You knew that Rhonda was number one in her heart. And the second dog we got, Katie, same thing. And she was mama's dog. And then when Isaiah came along, Katie was still mama's dog. She didn't become the kid's dog. So then the, the third dog, Isaiah was a little boy. We decided this next one's going to be his dog. So we got Tyler. We brought him home and we gave him to Isaiah. It took Rhonda about three months to steal Tyler away. And he became mom's dog as well, all for the rest of his life. Kind of a joke in our family. It just always happens that way. But the dog that we have right now, her name's Ellie, short for Eleanor. We got her 10 years ago. For some reason that nobody understands, from the time she first came into our house, she picked me. And it's the weirdest thing because I always think in my mind, we got the dog to be mom's dog, right? And that's just kind of the default. But for some reason, right from the beginning, Ellie chose me. And I have to tell you that even though I kind of don't seek that or want this, it's kind of cool, right? As a matter of fact, it's a joke in our house that Ellie now will give me kisses, but she won't give Rhonda any. <laughs> when we get home, she'll greet us both and she's happy to see us both, but I get the kisses and Rhonda doesn't. Do you know how fun that is as a husband to experience <laughs> on a regular basis? Uh, you know, it's funny because Rhonda says, uh, you know, it's really cool to watch and you know, she's still Rhonda's best friend. They do all the playing, most of it anyway. But, but I remember the first time she was maybe four or five months old, and I'm sitting on the couch watching the game. Nothing much going on. It's a slow Saturday. And Ellie jumped up on the couch, leaned into me, and put her arm across my arm, and then just sat there and watched the game with me like, you're mine, right? I said, Rhonda, check this out. Do you see what's happening here? Rhonda goes, that's just sick, right? That's just, <laughs> what is that? I don't know why she does this, but I have to tell you this. It's kind of cool, <laughs> right? It's kind of cool. And the reason I tell that story is this. God wants you to feel that. When Peter begins this letter to the church, he begins by calling our attention to the fact that God has personally and specifically chosen us. That we, the church of Jesus, the people of God, are chosen by him, not administratively, not like, you know, as a mob, but as individuals. You know, another way to think about this is, it's easy for all of us to grasp that God loves us. But Peter starts his letter to the church by reminding us that God also likes us. You know, we all have people we love but don't necessarily like. They come around at Thanksgiving and Christmas and you say, oh, I love you so much. Now go away. You know those people? <laughs> That's not this. God is talking to us about the reason he chose us. And, and, and there's a kind of choosing that we do that's ordinary. And then there's a kind of choosing 
that isn't, that's extraordinary. There's a kind of choosing that creates us. John Maxwell writes beautifully about this. He says, we tend to become what the most important people in our lives think we will become. Those people have that much influence on, especially as we're young and as we're going. We tend to become like what those people think we will be. Their believing, their choosing of us creates us. And I have a, a personal experience with that. Can I tell you that 35 years ago, I was a youth pastor at a church that went through a tr terrible time. The pastor went into moral failure. The church was split and it was just a, an awful time. And, and in the midst of all that, as we were wondering what was going to happen and was that church going to cease to be one night, we got a call from a small group of people in the church, about eight people, and they asked, Rhonda and I, the youth pastors, we're young 20-somethings, they said, would you come over to the house tonight for dinner? We said, sure, and we went to their house, thought, yeah, we're going to pray, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, what we're going through. But when we got there, we found out that they had asked us over for a very specific reason. They sat us down in the living room, and they said, Pastor Greg, Rhonda, we believe that you can pastor us through this season. We believe that you're the one to lead us through the season. I have to tell you that was overwhelming. That was emotional. I would have never guessed that. In fact, I was going through a season after being a youth pastor for a couple of years when I was thinking, man, is this too much for me? Is the demands of this kind of life too much for me? You know, and I was thinking that through, what am I going to do? And, and here come these people who, who chose us and said, we believe that you can lead us forward. And it's amazing 35 years later to look back because to this day, the same thing's still happening. You allow me, despite all my faults and failures, to continue to lead us as a church. And in so doing, your choosing creates me. And God wants to understand that his choosing is, us to understand that his choosing is what creates us. So listen to how Peter says it. First Peter chapter one, here we go. Peter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, we'll talk about the significance of that in a moment, to God's elect, to God's chosen, to the people that he has identified and called to himself, to God's elect, strangers in the world, yeah, because our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to another country. We're passing through. We're pilgrims. Really, in the most profound sense of the word, we ought to see ourselves as missionaries in this world. Just like we sang, we mimic Jesus. We go into the world with his message. Strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Nobody knows where those are, which is why you should not feel neglected if you're in Carbonado or Black Diamond or Cumberland or South Perry. God knows you're there, all right? He chose you there, right? Who have been, there's the word, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. All right, let's just pause for a moment. God wants you to feel chosen. See, here's the reality. We tend to think that our choice to receive Jesus as our Savior is the whole story of how we become believers. But the Bible says, no, God is also doing choosing. Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 15, verse 16, you didn't choose me, I chose you. There is a sense in which both we and God choose. And for this moment, for this morning, God wants you to sit down in the idea that he chose you. Do you believe that? The reason Peter is writing to the church is so that we might understand and feel that. God wants you to know that you're chosen. Just like Jesus said to the disciples, you say, well, there came a point in my life where I made a choice. Yes, you did. And that's real. But God was every bit as much choosing you in that process in the same way. And he wants us to grasp that. He wants us to feel that. 
And, and Peter, right from the beginning, knowing that, that he's going to be talking about this, identifies himself as an apostle. That's important, church. It's really important for the time in which we live. An apostle is someone who Jesus specifically chose and designated to carry unique authority in the Christian faith. There's only 12 of them, 13 if we do the Acts thing. But anyway, there's a small group of them. And that's really important to remember because pastors aren't free to say whatever they think or they feel. We are answerable to the apostles. This is the word of God, first and foremost. It's not what the hippest preacher is saying. It's not the, the leader who's telling us what we want to hear that is the word of God. It's this Bible. It is our final authority. Listen, friends, if you have some belief or conviction about God, and if someone asks you, why do you believe that? And all you can say is so-and-so said, that's not good. God wants your faith rooted in his word. And that's why Peter, right from the outset, says, hey, I'm writing to you as an apostle with that authority God gave me. And he invites us to recognize that and understand that. This is not just a man speaking, as the scripture says, this is a man speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we have. And what is he saying? He's saying we are God's elect who have been chosen. Not administratively, but personally. There's an administrative choosing, you know, you're at work and a job needs to be done. You six do this, you six do that. And it, it's really just kind of expedient. This is not like that. This is more like a husband choosing a wife. Or a wife choosing a husband. Or a parent choosing to adopt a child or have a child. This is a specific choosing that's personal. And God wants us to understand. He wants you to understand that he has chosen you. That's why you believe. That's a huge part of why you believe. Now, Peter goes on to say that God's choosing is according to his foreknowledge. That's why we have to understand that we can't tilt too far either way. It's not all about God's choosing. It's not all about our choosing. We both choose. He knows what we're going to choose. He choose, He knows our future and elects us accordingly. That's important to grasp. He knows that you are going to be honest enough to believe. And that's part of the choosing. He knows our future. You know, I, when I think about this, I remember when I was a boy, me and a couple neighborhood guys got together and we created a club and we met in a hollow tree that was on the side of his yard. And it was kind of our fort, our tree house. And, and we had a few rules in our club. And one of the rules was no girls allowed. Somebody say amen, right? No girls allowed in our club. And uh, we actually posted it one day on the outside of the tree, you know, no girls allowed. That's, you know, we were boys. And I didn't understand at the time, but the neighbor at the next yard looked over the fence and saw our sign. And I remember him laughing and he said, in a few years, you'll change your mind about that, fellas. <laughs> he knew our future. He knew what we would choose. And Peter says that's how God's choosing is. The only mistake we can make when we try to understand these things is if we ignore either his choosing or ours. God calls us to embrace both of those. But here's the thing. He chooses us because he knows how that choosing will create us. He chooses you because he knows how that choosing will create you. Wonderful book I read recently called Look is about a guy by the name of Tony Lucadello. Now, maybe you know that name. You probably don't. Tony Lucadello is considered by most to be Major League Baseball's greatest scout. If only the Mariners had hired him at some point. But here's why he's considered to be the greatest scout. Over the course of his career, he identified no fewer than 52 teenagers. So he's scouting at the high school level. He identified no fewer than 52 teenagers who went on to be stars in Major League Baseball. It's considered a good career if you identify six or eight that go on to be stars. I mean, that's a terrific career. He identified 52. In fact, two of them went on to be Hall of Famers. And when he was asked about his method, he explained it this way. He said, you know, when it comes to baseball scouts, he said 5% of them are just bad scouts. They don't know what they're looking at. They don't know what they're doing. They're just poor. He said about another 5% of them are nitpickers. All they do is go around and identify the weaknesses or faults or failures in prospective players. He said, then there's about 85% of them, and they're completely performance-based. They add up statistics. They look at size, weight, strength, speed, all this kind of stuff. They just put together all those pieces, and they say, all right, this guy's a prospect. This guy's not a prospect. And then he said, there's the 5%. He said, it might be fewer than that. He said, I, I aspire to be one of them. And he said, you know what we look for? We look for players who are coachable. We look for players 
who are interested in being coached, who are willing to be developed, who are willing to be grown, who are submissive to being trained and taught and mentored. And he said, that's, that's the secret to my success. I look for players who are coachable. In the same way, God chooses us to be coached. And, and before we jump into that a little bit, notice one thing more in passing. Peter says, we are chosen um, by the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. Notice that what he calls our attention to there is our uniquely Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Followers of Jesus believe in the Trinity, that God is three persons, but one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not three gods, three persons, one God, a mystery beyond our full ability to grasp, but nevertheless profoundly and significantly true. And he says, hey, understand that when you are called, fundamental to that calling is an entrance into a community of faith. We can only become godly. This is a big subject that we'll unpack later. We can only truly become godly when we are many gathered into one. Like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three gathered into one. The person who says, you know what, I just do my faith by myself. I do my own thing with God. It's just me and God. You're missing the point. The Christian faith teaches us that it's only together that we experience God fully. Friends, this is why church is fundamental to Christian faith. Whatever church you choose, it's important to be connected and to be a part of it. Because only when we are do we begin to experience and understand who God is calling us to be. The Christian faith uniquely in the world proclaims that God is love because he is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bonded together. This is why the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So Peter points us to that reality, reminds us of that reality, but then he also says that this choosing is for a specific purpose. He says it's for sprinkling by the blood of Christ, to be sprinkled by the blood of Christ, and for obedience to Jesus Christ. What do those two things mean? Let's take a minute and understand that. First of all, the word picture of being sprinkled by his blood refers to what Christians call justification, which is God declares us innocent and reconciled to him. God declares us people he not only loves but likes. God declares us to be part of his family in fellowship with him. That's what's called justification. Peter uses the phrase sprinkled by his blood because in the Old Testament, Exodus 16, 17, Exodus 24, many other places, Leviticus 16, 17, Exodus 24, when somebody is atoned and reconciled to God, they would be sprinkled with the blood of the sacrifice. Peter knows his audience understands that. So he says, Gentiles, you Gentiles I'm writing to now understand that you have been chosen to be sprinkled in that, which, which means to be, catch this church, so important, to be given righteousness from God. To be given righteousness from God. Not something we attain, not something we earn, not, not a ladder we climb, but a gift given to us by God. And Peter wants us to understand that we have been chosen to be given that gift. You, you may have heard me uh, talk uh, uh, before about a friend of mine when I was in the Marines. His name was Rick. And, and Rick was only in the Marines because his dad, who was a fabulously wealthy Southern California developer, his dad said, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, receive your inheritance unless you go spend a few years in the military and learn how the rest of the world lives, learn how to serve, learn how to not be the rich kid. And so Rick was in the military only to do that. I remember one time he was going to have a birthday party at his house. He invited a few of us to come. And uh, this is a massive house in a very wealthy part of Los Angeles. And I mean, talk about fish out of water. We, we came from elsewhere and we drive up to this house and, and we, you know, there's all this ostentatious wealth and we walk up to the door and, and oh, what are you doing here? Well, Rick invited us. All right, what's your name? You know, and, and Rick had put our name on a little card. And then the guy at the front desk put a stamp on our hands because there were hundreds of people there. And the stamp said, Rick's friend. <laughs> that was cool. Because the rest of the night, we're like walking around among all these wealthy people. And we're, yeah, look at me, baby. You got one of these? I'm Rick's friend, you know? I have been, I mean, it was so cool to feel like you belonged. To feel like you were wanted. Because Rick said so. 
That's what Peter wants us to grasp. God has given us righteousness in Christ. But the point of it is not merely to be indulged. And that's the other thing he talks about. The point of it, the point of it is to experience obedience to Christ, which brings transformation. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3 this. He says, we have a righteousness from God. A rightness with God, a reconciliation with God that we don't create, but God gives to us. It comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. We have a righteousness from God. And we're meant to rejoice in that. But can I give you a cautionary tale? A lot of us never get around to owning that. You know, my wife and I, on Friday, we uh, had a date night. We went down to Anthony's home port uh, in Federal Way. We, we love to do seafood. And, and so, you know, we're going to have a, a night out. And we drive down there to have dinner. And it was awesome. And, you know, it was expensive also. But here's the thing. When we drove down there, we have this pile of Anthony's home port gift cards that people in the church have given us over the years for Christmas and birthday. And we never got around to spending. We feel kind of self-conscious if they knew that, that we've had this card they gave us 10 years ago and we haven't cashed it yet how would they feel you know Rhonda keeps them in her underwear drawer so we went into the underwear drawer and we got these <laughs> cards out of there and we go to Anthony's home port and the beautiful thing was we had this awesome dinner right it's sunset a gorgeous sunset Friday night maybe you saw that we're right by the window watching the sun go down thinking God loves us more than other people you know we're doing this whole thing here and then the bill came and we're like check this out cards baby and we lay these cards it didn't cost us a penny God wants you to feel like that. God wants us to feel like that. He has chosen us for sprinkling by his blood to be justified by his grace. You know, and here's the truth. You know, Rod and I sat there at the table and we remembered, we said, you know, the people who gave us these cards, they gave it to us because they loved us. They gave it to us because they wanted to bless us. They gave it to us because of them, not us. Isn't this cool? Yeah, we received this. This is good. There's still a whole lot more cards in that underwear drawer. I'm looking forward to it next time. Let me ask you this. Have you received God's righteousness? Have you allowed yourself to receive that gift? Or are you still trying to earn it? Are you still trying to deserve it? Peter says, no, you're chosen to receive a free gift. Sprinkling by his blood justification. But then he goes on to say, you're also chosen for obedience to Jesus Christ because it transforms you. In other words, you're also chosen to be coached. You're chosen to be coached. Because that coaching, that obedience to Jesus leads to a kind of transformation that nothing else in this world can produce. Let me say that again. Obedience to Jesus Christ brings transformation into your heart, your soul, your spirit, and your life that nothing else in this world can produce. You can train your head off at the local gym and you won't get this. You can study your brain out at whatever advanced university you choose and you won't get this. This only comes to those coached into obedience by Jesus Christ. And Paul, Peter, at the end of this passage in verses 8 and 9, talks about the experience of people who walk in that obedience. He says, they are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for they are receiving the goal of their faith, the salvation of their souls. It's a transformation you can't find anywhere else. And it comes through that obedience. You know, can I share a personal story? We have some friends visiting with us this weekend. Uh, and actually, we're going to have lunch with them this afternoon. Larry and Irma. And Larry and Irma are precious people to us now. They, they live in Florida now, but they flew back to the U.S. to meet with friends and family in Port Orchard this weekend and celebrate their 50th anniversary. Wow, isn't that awesome? Here's why they're special to us. When Ron and I were brand new believers... 20 years old, didn't grow up church, in church for the first time, opening our lives to Jesus. They were in their 30s, and they kind of took us under their wings. They mentored us. They pulled us in. They invited us to their house. We'd watch the game and so on. Actually, they had an ulterior motive. They directed the children's church, and they were recruiting, and they pulled us into the kids' church, right? But for the next three years, almost every Sunday, we worked side by side with them in children's church. And an amazing thing happened. Over those three years, I began to look into the mirror 
and not see Greg the violent, sometimes criminal, angry, foolish, ignorant person. I began to see Greg who teaches and serves kids. Greg, who is a part of the ministry team at his local church. Greg and Rhonda, who, who, who are the ones the kids love best because we're young. Greg and Rhonda, you know, who, who are being obedient to Jesus. And I have to tell you, that brought about a transformation in our hearts that we still feel profoundly. And we have Larry and Irma to thank for that. And they feel it too because they called us up and they said, hey, we're going to be there. Uh, here's what we'd like to do. Can we come to church and then go to your house, get pizza and watch the Seahawks game together? Because that's what we did back then. Yeah, that's cool. Their choosing of us created us. And God wants you and me to receive that same kind of choosing. And it's really important that we understand that it is his choosing that transforms us, not our achievements or accomplishments. Moses thought his past mistakes had ended his purpose. He's hanging out in Midian 40 years, tending sheep, once the son of Pharaoh, once wanting to be Israel's savior, and now all that's gone and almost forgotten because of his failures. And then a burning bush speaks to him in the desert and says, Moses, I'm choosing you. Moses said, ah, not me, God. I got too many problems. I got too many hangups. We already know that I'll mess this up. God says, no, Moses, I'm choosing you. I'm choosing you. And my choosing will create you. And it did, church. In his 80s, God turned him into, humanly speaking, the Savior of Israel. And he chooses you. And me for the same purpose. In order to create us. Let me challenge you as we get ready to close this morning. Will you believe more in God's choosing than your failures? Will you believe more in being chosen? In being elected? Than you will in your struggles and hangups? God invites us to. Because he knows how to coach us. Into all that we can be. So Peter wraps up, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, celebrating this choosing, this election. In his great mercy, he has given us, there's the same idea again, he has given us, it's a gift. He has given us new birth into a living hope, an ongoing expectation of transformation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And what's he saying? He's saying we rejoice in this choosing because we know what it means. We know what it means to us personally. He has given us righteousness from God. It's a gift. He has given us new birth. A supernatural thing happens when you believe in Jesus. It's more than, than a, a life change it's a soul change. He has given us living hope. That is an expectation. By the word, the, the, the Greek word hope is different than the English word hope. It's stronger. It doesn't mean a thing that might happen. It means a thing that will happen, just hasn't happened yet. You and I are hoping that the sun will come up tomorrow, but we know the sun will come up tomorrow. That's the idea. Given us a living hope through the resurrection of the dead. What do we know? What do we know as followers of Jesus Christ? We know this life isn't all there is. <laughs> Do you let yourself know that? That's where that hope is rooted, that there's a life beyond. What a great thing to know. I talk about my friend Rick and the Marine Corps. One day we were just having a miserable day. We're out at 29 Palms in the desert. We're filthy. We've been out there for days. We're dead tired. We've been digging ditches, doing stuff we hate. We don't want to do it anymore. And Rick looked at me with a grin on his face. His face was black with dirt, teeth had sand in it. He looked at me and goes, guess what, Greg? After this is all over, I'm still rich. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're right. And he's, you know, he's going through this a little different. Peter says, yeah, that's reality. We have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And by the way, church, kept in heaven for you. You know what that means? It means it's not up to you to keep it. God's keeping it for you. And Peter is just busting his suspenders here with joy. And he wants you and me to feel that same sense of being chosen. Let me ask you, do you let yourself feel it? Do you let yourself feel it? He writes, in this you greatly rejoice. And then he gets realistic. He says, I know it's not all candy and kisses down here. 
He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. He says, I'm not doing a Pollyanna thing. I'm not doing a pretend thing. This isn't a cartoon. This isn't an infomercial. This is real. He says, there's tough stuff. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ is revealed. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold. We're almost done this morning, but let me just crack the door on eternity for just a moment with you. Most of us assume that when we leave this life and go to heaven, we will see all of God. Friends, the reality is God is infinite. And even though you and I, when we go to the other side, will be eternal, we will not be infinite. Only he is. That's a beautiful thing because it means no no matter how much we learn, no matter how much we experience, no matter how much we discover about God, there's always more. And if you're saying to yourself, I've pretty much discovered everything with there, you're not paying attention because the revelations go on and on forever. And so your faith is crucial because we must always trust God for what we can't see because of what we do see. We trust who God is in Christ because we see Jesus for all the things we can't see. Faith, being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see, is absolutely crucial to heaven because there's always more of him. And that's why Peter writes about the growing of our faith. That's why it's so precious and important to God. And it is the understanding of what happens to our faith that is the reward for the grief and trials. You eventually lose your fear of grief and trials. I always remember a lady named Joanne. She was part of the widows group at the church we served in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, I jokingly called the widows the black widows because they'd done away with all their husbands. You know, they had, it was just them now. And Joanne was, Joanne was so looking forward to dying. She would tell me about it all the time. She told me about it for three years. <laughs> Pastor, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. And her health was failing. She was into her 90s and she was struggling. But she said, Pastor, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm closer. Pastor, I'd go to her house. She'd be on the couch all wrecked. She'd say, I'm almost there. I thought to myself, you are awesome. You are so awesome. She taught me so much about faith. Peter says that's how we as believers live. Because we understand that. Romans chapter 5 tells us this. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. Paul writes to the Corinthians, our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And we know that. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. We're looking forward. Like Rick, we say, man, being here in the desert sucks, but I'm rich. And pretty soon I'm going home to my inheritance. God wants you to feel that alongside your being chosen. And then finally, the last thing. Oh my goodness, we don't have time for that. In verses 10 to 12, I'll finish this. Paul says, in a nutshell, you can follow this up, verses 10 to 12. He says, and here's the last, Peter says, and here's the last thing you want to understand. He says, your story isn't just about you. He said, the prophets in the past who gave us these revelations of who God is, they understood that what they experienced wasn't for them, it was for others. And he says, they knew that. They knew their story was about a bigger story and that they only played a part of it. And he said, you need to understand that in your chosenness, you also play a part In a bigger story, I had a buddy who played uh, college football at a very high level, and he was an offensive lineman. He told me something one day I never forgot. He said, you know, he's a guard on the offensive line. He says, most of the time when you're a guard, you have no idea what's going on in the play. He says, the ball is snapped, and you're in a grunting scrum with a bunch of other guys in a five-yard box, and you're just trying to maul each other. And most of the time, you can't see what's going on on the rest of the field. You know a play was called, run, pass, whatever it was. You know it was called, but you're just face-to-face with some other fat, sweaty guy, and you're mashing each other. And he says, you don't even know what's going on. But he says, later during the week when we do our film study, all of a sudden I can see that what I did when I moved that guy one foot to the left was actually the key to the whole play. And you know, if you are a serious football watcher, you don't watch the receivers and running backs, you watch those linemen. Because what they're doing is making everything else happen. And, and Peter says, grasp this about your chosenness. 
grasp this about it. It's about more than you. It's about others around you and what they experience. And he says, in that, in that, you find a greater joy than you can ever find anywhere else. Let me finish with a story because I never do that on a Sunday morning. Irina Sendler is probably a name you don't know. She was a young nursing student, 19 years old in Poland in 1939, when her country was invaded by the Germans. She was yanked out of school and assigned to be a, a, a home health worker checking for communicable diseases in the Jewish ghetto of Warsaw. Now, not being a Jew herself, she had no particular dog in that fight, but she was assigned there. She didn't want to be. She wanted to finish nursing school, but, you know, She's yanked out and she's assigned to go house to house and ask families and explore for about communicable diseases because the Nazis knew when they forced everybody in this ghetto sooner or later, that's what was going to happen. Well, it didn't take her long to figure out what the Nazis were really up to with the Jews. And while she had gone there reluctantly, having been chosen for what wasn't a blessing, she very quickly realized that it also came with a profound opportunity. And so this 19-year-old young girl pulled together a few of her fellow nursing students and they set off on a mission. The mission was to identify these Jewish children in these homes, then find matching families in greater Poland who were not Jewish, whose kids weren't in the ghetto, match their names and ages, and then use that information to smuggle Jewish children out of Warsaw to the safety of these other families. And over the next five years, this bunch of teenagers led by Irina were responsible for saving the lives of over 2,500 Jewish children in the Warsaw Ghetto. And she made such a profound impact that when the reality of what they had done came out, she became an inspiration to generations of young women in Poland and in Eastern Europe who went on to nursing careers, who went on to serving careers, who went on to lives dedicated to the welfare of others. Irina passed away in 2005, and most of the world doesn't know her name, but God does. <laughs> and the family trees of 2,500 plus Jewish children, they all know who Irina is. You want to count like that? God says, that's why I chose you. That's why I chose you. And it's when you allow my choosing to lead you into obedience to my son, Jesus Christ, that that transformation happens. So this morning, God wants you to know that he's chosen you. The question is, will you receive that choosing? Do you bow your heads with me? Close your eyes. Maybe as you sit here this morning, you don't know God as your father. Peter's message to you is that he wants you to. He's choosing you. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says God adopts you as his daughter, his son. And he's inviting you to that this morning. He's choosing you. And, and he hears your heart. In this moment, you can say to him, yes, God, I receive your choosing. I receive your son as my Savior. You can do that in this moment. And you'll begin to experience that transformation, that new birth, that living hope, that resurrection from the inside out. It starts right here in a simple moment like this when you get real and honest with God. You can do that right now. Go ahead. He's listening. He's listening to you. Maybe you know you're chosen and, and you've carried around that chosenness like a bunch of gift cards in an underwear drawer. God's saying this morning, I want you to cash them in. I want you to take those things out and live in them. Remember, I gave you this gift for obedience to my son because that's the joy your heart hungers for. Maybe you need to take those cards out of your drawer and cash them in. The Holy Spirit invites you to this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we are chosen. God, how could we ever thank you enough for that? And Lord, as we go from here today, let it be with that awareness. Send us out like Rick in the Marine Corps, knowing that he had an inheritance. We pray for that. We ask it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, friends? Yeah. It's great to see you. 
Sorry, I couldn't do anything about my face while I was gone. I'm stuck with this face, so here it is. But as we go from here, go as chosen people. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you throughout this week. Go with God. Tell someone you love them. Have a great afternoon.